That video was a lot of fun. That last picture uh, was all the staff that worked so hard and diligently uh, to pour into the lives of each of these students, uh, but also to my life as well. Uh, I told them I'm not going to cry, so I'm not going to cry. Um, but I knew for me, camp was always a big part of my life. I watched my cousin get saved at camp. I, I was saved at camp. Um, so it's always been a big part of my life, but I never realized how impactful it was as an adult to go. Uh, we got to celebrate six salvations while there at camp this week. Um, uh, from different churches. Uh, we got to make friends um, from different churches. We got to have staring contests uh, with friends from different churches. Uh, if you want to see a picture, just let me know. I'll, I'll show it to you later. Um, we got to meet a lot of cool people. Um, but it wasn't just all fun and games. Um, they, you, if you saw anything in the video and you wanted more clarification, just ask them. We got to dance with silent disco headphones. It was so cool. Um, but we learned a lot. Um, so our, our theme this year, as you see on our shirts, was Matchless One. And so we went through a few different things. Um, and the first one, just to kind of give you guys an idea, the first one we went through was Matchless Forgiveness. Um, and so we talked about forgiving others, uh, and, but also our forgiveness that we receive with Christ dying on the cross. Uh, we talked about Matchless Sacrifice and Jesus dying on the cross and how there's nothing in this world that compares to the sacrifice that took place on the cross. And we talked about matchless obedience. Um, that fought, And a pastor, Mark Taylor, a wonderful pastor, mentioned that falling in love is an accident, but walking in love is a choice. Um, and talked about what it looks like to be obedient followers of Christ. And then the final night, we talked about matchless risk and what it looks like to take a risk for our faith. Um, and to go out and spread the gospel. And that's what we got to do each day. We, we got to end the day with fun. We got to go and see Philly. Let me tell you guys, you think Lynchburg drivers are bad? Visit Philly. Am I right? Yeah. We could park wherever we wanted, sidewalks, middle of the street. You know, it's fine. Drive however fast you want to drive. Drive however slow you want to drive. You know, Philly had no rules uh, when driving. But we got to go out and, and visit this one church. And I have some pictures here. Actually, guys, can you? over here so they can see some of the pictures behind you. Thank you. This is where we served, guys, and this is kind of why we're doing worship the way we're doing it this morning. Um, we served at this church here, and this is the yard of the church. Um, this church is called Ecclesia of North Philly, um, and it's a church plant. Um, and can you go to the next picture? You can't quite see the sign, um, but it says Kurth's Cooked Seafood. So it's an old seafood restaurant um, that this church meets in. You go to the next one. That's one of their entrances. There's a few little kids there. Uh, but we got to uh, spend time with them. So half the day we were with them, or half the time we were with them, we were out in the community doing something. Um, so I'm sure some of them will share some testimony of what we did. But we got to go do a scavenger hunt in the cemetery. Um, so that was really cool. Um, we played at the park. Um, we got to watch a movie with them. Um, we also got to do VBS with them, which was really cool. We got to watch them um, act out Bible stories. Um, and these are little kids, um, to, from baby to uh, fifth grade. Um, so they were very small kids. I mean, go to the next picture. This is their sanctuary. Um, it's very small. Um, it's also very noisy when everybody's talking at once. But it was an incredible time. We were singing, uh, um, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. We were singing that with the kids um, there in that picture. Um, go to the next one. This is their children's room. Um, and they have a lot of kids. And yeah. Um, this melted my heart to see that this is how small their children's room is. Um, next one. And there's one bathroom in this church. Um, and so that's what they're living with. Um, next picture. We got to play outside with them. There's a little girl doing Zoe's hair. Um, she, she was going to do mine, but didn't get to do it. Um, you know, uh, playing soccer and kickball. And, and then Vanessa down here on the bottom with a, one of the little girls. But we each had a buddy. 
and I had two, I had two little buddies, they were brothers, um, Noah and Adam, um, and one day we were talking about what their biggest fear was, and they said their biggest fear in life was to lose their electricity. And you, would, you think, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand that. But they said the reason being is because they live off frozen meals. So they knew if they lost power, their food would go bad. Or they wouldn't have a way to cook their meals. Um, and so this was, it was really hard to hear. Um, and I think that week, this week alone really showed me, like this wasn't my first time in Philly, but it showed me once again how much I take for granted. Because a little small thing like that is a big thing to them. I even lost power last night and thought about it. Um, but that, that's what their biggest fear was. But it was so cool to see the joy they had when they were acting out the burning bush from Exodus. And they were pretending to be Moses and God, and they knew the answers to the Bible, and they knew God was with them. But they still feared that. They still had a little bit of fear. Uh, but it was a great time. Um, I could talk forever and ever, but I won't because their stories are more important. Um, but it was really a great time to watch each of them grow. Um, I'm proud of these students. I'm proud of all of our students, even those that didn't go to camp. Um, but so many people bragged on these kids while we were at camp. So many people. Wow, your students are awesome. I didn't do anything. They kept me in line. Uh, <laughs> um, but these are uh, great, such great students, and I'm so blessed to be able to work with them. But I thank you guys for how much you pray for them, how much you give and invest, whether it was donating towards camp or praying for them um, throughout the week um, or just saying encouraging them whenever you see them. So I want to thank you guys as well for giving me the chance to work with them, but also the way you pour into them. But I'm going to stop talking now. Uh, these are our wonderful students, and I'm going to let them share some of their testimonies. Thank you to everyone who prayed for us and donated to make it possible for us to go to camp this year. So as you saw in the video and the pictures, we had the opportunity to go to camp in Philadelphia. We had a lot of fun hanging out and playing games, laughing way too hard, going to nightlife and the mega relay. But we did much more than just have fun. We got to serve as a church um, at a local church's VBS. And each of us got assigned a buddy. And every day we got the opportunity to play with them, get to know them, and share the love of Jesus with them. And my buddy was Taikim, and he was the best. My favorite part of the week was when we got to site and the kids were on the other side of the street unloading from their van. And I saw Taikim standing on the other side. <laughs> I just shouted his name and waved at him, and he got the biggest smile on his face and ran over to me. And he was just the sweetest. And another highlight of my week was um, teaching him the Bible song and hearing him sing to himself in the car. I think each one of our buddies taught us something different. But Takim definitely showed me what it's like to be joyful and to show God's love to others. Something God taught me this week was that in this life we're going to have trials and it's going to be hard, but we should always be full of joy because God is good and works all things out for the good of those who love him and for his glory. Ooh, that's a hard one to top. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to everyone who made this trip possible. There are many people who helped make sure our trip was able to go. Going into the trip, I didn't have many expectations, but I definitely didn't expect to come out of it with a whole new mindset. I feel like a lot of people stay on a camp high, so I prayed that God would give me the words to today to show you guys how life-changing this trip was for me. There were so many fun activities, 
we got the privilege of doing such as Silent Disco Night, where we all sang Let It Go from Frozen way too loud and danced way too hard, or the incredible worship that Fuge provided for us, or even the extremely fun Mega Relay, relay Race, where I watched our group work together and with another church in a way I had never seen done by them before. But there was more to this trip than just these fun activities. Each day our church went out into Eastern Philadelphia where we got to put on a VBS for kids in the community. I'm not even gonna lie, the first day we pulled up to the tiny little what used to be seafood restaurant. I was unsure about everything. Unsure about serving, unsure about safety, and most of all I felt that there was no way God could use me there. Let me just say this, God can always use you. Each one of us got paired up with a kid and they were our buddy for the week. I had a five-year-old girl named Zofia she came from a broken family, yet she always had a huge smile on her face. It didn't matter to her that they didn't have anything. All she knew was that her life as a five-year-old seemed perfect. I think sometimes we forget, we forget how broken our world is, and even in our own country. I had never seen anything like it in my life, and the worst part of that, this broken place is only three states away. A place where a kid's biggest fear was losing electricity because it meant that they couldn't heat their frozen meals. I don't know about you guys, but wow, that opened my eyes. God has given us this life for a purpose. Don't let that go to waste and always trust him because he will always provide. This trip served as an example in my life of how amazing and faithful God is. Not only did I learn more about God through serving in the community, but I, but I learned a lot just by talking to a girl from another church. I actually got to lead her to Christ on the trip. To me, it showed that God can use me anywhere, whether that be in a Bible study, at work, or in a simple conversation with another teenager, or on a missions trip six hours away. So thank you, Zach, for this incredible opportunity, and thank you, church, for supporting us the whole way. My experience at camp was amazing. I've learned so much, and it was so much fun. My favorite part was worship, but also going to site. Going into the town of Philly, I wasn't expecting it to, I was expecting it to look like the town of Lynchburg. I learned at sight that we need to be grateful for what we have because not everybody has what we have. Plus sight was so amazing. I love seeing the happiness on the kids' faces. So my other favorite part was worship. The songs were good and the pastor was amazing. Day two of camp, we talked about sacrifice, that we need to stop holding back and open the doors for God. That stood out to me because some of us have that one thing that holds, that holds us back, but there's no time to wait. Overall, I had a great time at camp. I am so thankful that I got to go to this camp and with these people. Camp taught me a lot of new things and things I can work on. Camp taught me perspective. While we were together, our service was helping kids out of VBS. We each had one or two buddies. My buddies were Layla and Kayla. One day, the activities was to perform a little skit. I got another buddy, Paige. Our skit was the story of Lazarus, and the girls worked together to figure out who would be who. Layla was Martha, Kayla was Mary, Paige was Jesus, and I was Lazarus. So there was three stations, and on the third station, you had to act it out. But we were t then told that there were no speaking, so we had to come up with something using our body and emotions. We performed it, and the others in that group had to guess what Bible story it was. Everyone got it pretty quickly. Camp also taught me that I can work on forgiveness. Wednesday, the 22nd, was about how God forgives you. When I was younger, I did something that I shouldn't have done and never really forgave myself. So while the pastor, Mark, was talking, I was thinking about it. It wasn't until later in the night when we had our church group time that I really forgave myself. Zach handed out index cards, or as he says, note cards, and told us to write, <laughs> told us to write a few things down. The last one was, what do you need to forgive yourself for? Then we went into a little silence so we could pray for forgiveness in others and forgiving ourselves, and I did. I forgave myself for what I did, and I never would have done it if I hadn't gone to camp. If Mark hadn't preached about it, if Zach hadn't given out those cards. So thank you, Zach, for the opportunity to go to camp. Thank you for helping me forgive myself. 
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'll let you guys sit down. They were nervous. So, not. We also want to, I also want to, I know she's not here. She's in Israel having the time of her life. But I want to thank Hannah Street as well. For those of you who don't know, she, she sacrificed um, driving down from Pennsylvania um, to go with us to camp, to ride back to Pennsylvania, to spend a week with us, then come back um, to be our adult chaperone. So I want to thank her too um, publicly and just the work that she did with all the girls because it was all these girls and Elliot and I. Uh, but, but Elliot and I had a great time. Uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a funny kid, so just watch your back. You know what they say, beware the quiet ones. So, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, yeah, we thank you guys so much for all, everything you do for us. And uh, we just want to spend the rest of our time um, in worship and just sharing some more, really just the gospel um, through the songs that we got to um, experience and sing at camp as well. So you guys don't mind, um, we'll go ahead and stand and we'll continue in our time of worship. As you guys were sharing, I feel like there were so many jokes welling up inside of me. Like, why did they make the gimpy one Lazarus? He died. <laughs> Especially, we just talked about that. I mean, well, that has just got to be providence. If God ever wanted there to be a joke made, that had to be it. The other thing I'm confused about is what is the deal with fanny packs? I know you don't call them fanny packs now, but it's a fanny pack, okay? In the 90s, it was a fanny pack, and you wore it around your waist. I don't know if you think it's different because you wear it around your shoulder, but it's the same <laughs> oh my goodness also I would probably have paid money to watch you guys bl or what did you call it deaf disco what, is that what it was <laughs> silent disco well it was deaf to me I couldn't hear it so many jokes You want to come tell one? She's snorting up here. <laughs> All right. Well, we wanted to give uh, a lot of time this morning to uh, these guys to be able to share at camp. And this is something that was important for me growing up as well. Um, I always love going to camp. There's something special about camp because it forces you out of your, uh, out of your comfort zone and gives you an opportunity to really kind of listen to the Word, to experience worship, to engage in service and ministry in ways that it's difficult to do in your normal environment because you're so consumed with all the distractions that come with your, your normal everyday life. And when you're separated from that, what happens is you tend to be able to focus on what you ought to be focusing on and therefore receive a certain amount of grace through that that you might not normally know that God is pouring out on you because you're so consumed with all the distractions. Remember what Jesus tells to, to Martha? Martha, Martha, you are distracted with so many things, but Mary, Mary has chosen the better thing. Not because the things of this life aren't necessary, right? We have to keep up with our house and do our homework and all those kind of things. But sometimes those things invade our ability to be able to really perceive what God is doing and to, to follow Him and whatever He's calling us to. And so uh, I hope that you got to hear some of those things uh, this morning. In fact, it was through, partially through some camp experience and a camp share experience that I'm even standing up here uh, today. So I originally didn't want to be a preacher because preachers don't make any money, okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not complaining against you guys uh, are very generous with us. But, right, I mean, we all know that you don't get into ministry to make money. If you did, then I would be on TV telling you things you want to hear rather than things you need to hear. Um, but I wanted to be a doctor because doctors make money, right? And, uh, and I love kids, so I wanted to be a pediatrician. But God wouldn't let me go with that. And so I remember one particular camp experience. I think I was maybe 10th grade, 10th or 11th grade. I can't remember exactly. And we were having a camp share, and I was up there. And I was basically just preaching because, you know, I guess that's what I was built to do. And, uh, and one of the deacons of our church came to me, and he said, you need to go into ministry. And I looked at him like he was crazy. I'm like, I'm not 
doing that. But then I came to Liberty for a college for a weekend, and I came back to another college for a weekend, and before you know it, here I am, okay? And so, you know, camp is often a very formative experience for, for youth, for students, and even for, like, as women we go on retreats, or men we go on retreats, or whatever, right? These are opportunities for us to separate from the normal everyday things of life, and to really focus on what God is telling to us. And I want to take this opportunity to use that to piggyback on just this idea about intergenerational ministry. Now, I'm not designing this as a reproach to any of us, but rather an encouragement to continue, right? You heard the students' testimonies and thank yous for all that you've done for them, but to continue even beyond that. Because it's one thing to to donate money and, and to even pray, but we've got to go beyond that to see that the church is not bifurcated into all these different little groups, separated in all these different little groups, that we're all together as one. And I remember as a kid, right, you we, at least we used to call church, this part of church, big church, right? And when you graduate out of children's church, you go to big church. But I think sometimes we still treat there's like this separation between, you know, youth and college and then adults. And certainly there are differences or life stage differences, different things that we face and are going through. But we all go to big church, Okay, those little kids, they're part of big church. And these guys, they're part of big church. And the college students, when they come back, they're part of big church. Right? There's no, there's no real difference between any of us if we are children of God. Now, we may have different experiences and struggles, but really that's a good thing because those who have already gone through them can help us who are presently going through them. And those of us who may be a little bit younger and have some enthusiasm and some different things like you know, we can lean down and pick up babies that are, are heavy, right? Maybe some of the older ones can't do that, right? There's a, a needfulness for all of us together to do this. And so I think that what we have to do is to look beyond just financial support and even praying for others as good as that those things are, necessary as those things are, to really engage in a more robust and thoroughgoing idea of what it means to be a church and all the diversity that exists there, even through ages, Okay, So what I want to do is I want to read to you a few texts here. We're not going to explicate them in, in great detail. I just wanted to try to use them to, to show you that the church is built on a diversity of people, not the least of which is ages, different ages within the same body. So consider in, Cor- in Acts chapter 10 and 11, Cornelius, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but right Peter is given a vision, and he's told to go over to Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And in that context, right, Peter preaches the gospel to he and his entire household, and the whole household gets saved and is baptized. Now, we don't know exactly who's in the household, right? We don't know how old these people are, but you get the impression that Cornelius is a person of probably middle age, right? He's, he has children and, and slaves and all these other people in this household that he's responsible for. The same thing happens later on in Romans, I mean in Acts chapter 16 with the Roman jailer. In fact, here it says, They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house, and he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And so on and so forth. So we have examples in the scripture where the church is inviting a whole household of people into the body. And this should be expected. In fact, the what's often called household tables. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about this through Colossians. It gives commands to a variety of people. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. So notice Paul even addresses children in his writing to the church. He does the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4. Or consider Titus 2, which is probably the classic passage when we talk about relating to one generation to the other. He says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible 
In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. What this, all these texts indicate to us is that the church is a diverse group of even intergenerational people, all of these redeemed believers who are working together to glorify God, to serve the good of one another, and of course to spread the gospel to a world in need. So that's what I want to do. I'll give you kind of three quick ideas this morning that kind of form a, a philosophy for intergenerational ministry. And then I'm going to try to challenge you with a few application steps as well. So the first thing is this. In fact, if you've been here on Wednesday nights in Colossians, you've heard me say these same things, maybe not exactly the same way. But the first thing is this. Scripture conceives of the church as a diverse group of people with different gifts and talents to contribute. Right? So everywhere that you see the church show up, it is not homogenous. Okay? It's not the same people that have congregated around a similar social trait. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of times churches end up being formed or perpetrate. What unites churches is not a social thing, right? We are united around a message, a person that that message is about. And so that group is going to be diverse because we ought to look like a redeemed community, a redeemed example of the community in which we are found. So when we talk about diversity in the church, we're going to find that there are, ought to be men and women, people from different ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds, right? Those people in Philadelphia are just as much a part of the body of Christ, even though they may not be as fortunate as we are, right? There's nothing that separates them from us, truly, they had the same need, which was Jesus Christ, to save them from their sin. They had the same hope, which is glory in heaven with Him. Right? So there's nothing that separates us from any other person. We all have the same need. We all have the same possible Savior and the same hope and glory if we know Jesus. So whether you're rich or poor, black or white, Asian, Hispanic, wherever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, it doesn't matter. Right? We are people who need Jesus. There's no amount of money that's going to get us into heaven. There's no amount of poverty that can keep us out. We are built. The church is built on diversity. And even, as I said, diversity in ages. I've told you the story before about the church in Texas. We didn't see it this time whenever we went. Uh, actually, I'm trying to remember. I think it was in McKinney. But, right, a, a church for 55 and up, okay? Which I've told you before, this is not a church. That's not a church. That's a social club that puts Jesus on their sign, okay? That's not a church. A church is not intentionally discriminatory. If we exclude people from the, from the fellowship of the church that are truly redeemed then we've ceased to be a church because we don't have the keys to the kingdom. The king has it, right? He's the one who has invited anyone and everyone. In fact, what does he command? Go out into the highways and the hedges and bring them in. Compel them to come. So there's no one that is unable by the grace of God to come into the body of of Christ. So, Scripture everywhere conceives of the church as a diverse group with different gifts and talents to contribute, whether that's in terms of our ethnicity or even in terms of our age. I remember growing up, and I would, we would always hear this phrase, well, the youth of the church are tomorrow. And I think what was meant by that is these are the people that are going to take the helm and move the church into the future, which is true. But the, ch the youth, right, the children, the, any of us, are not just the church of tomorrow. Or the church of today. One of the things I was glad about seeing is if all of our people, like if he breaks his hand and, and Tank breaks his hand again, right? We got some people to replace these guys, right? We'll be fine. It's not going to be me. But we got some folks that can come, right? We have a group of people, a diverse group of people that have different talents and abilities, and they all have something to contribute. Right? Everyone is on the team in church. No one gets left out. There's no one who's accidental. Everyone is integral. 
I think I told you this on the, on the Wednesday night, right? Bench warmer is not one of the spiritual gifts in the church. Or if we make it a little bit more traditional, pew warmer, right? Everyone is needed from the oldest to the youngest and everything in between. So there's no one that gets, should get left out because there's no one who's accidental to the function of the body. Right? As I said, these students, they're not just the church of tomorrow. They are, but they're also the church of today. And the adults, right? They're not just the church of yesterday. They're the church of today and tomorrow, right? All of us are called to serve the king until he calls us home. No one gets a pass on that. Which means a couple of things. One, if we are idle, we need to kick it into gear. And if we think we're unneeded, we need to combat that lie. If we think someone else is unneeded, then we need to combat that lie. All of us are integral to the function of the church. In uh, The Compelling Community, a book by Mark Dever and Jamie Dunlap, they talk about the danger of of homogeny, uh, of churches being the same, same all the, in every way, or by grouping people by various natural similarities, right? We organize age-graded Sunday school classes and small groups based on shared stages of life for singles and young marrieds and mothers of young children and seniors and, exam- and you know, everything. We have men's and women's groups, and we design services who prefer, for people who prefer traditional music and those who like contemporary music and All these things can be helpful things. But the danger of this approach, if it's the only way that we approach church, is that it tends to obscure, as they say, the supernatural diversity that the gospel produces. So again, we're not trying to say that all these groupings are wrong. There may have different aspects in the life of the church that are good. But what we have to see in the church is that we are not designed to be a people who create a bunch of silos and then we stay separate, right? The whole point of the gospel is to make a new people reconciled to one another. We read that just a second ago, who are also reconciled to God. So what unites us as a body is not a social tie, right? You and I don't associate together because we make similar amounts of money or just even live in a similar place. What unites us together is that we have the same Savior. In fact, it may be that if that weren't true, we may never even be friends. And that's okay because what makes us friends is not our like for one another, because sometimes that's difficult, but because we love Jesus and He loves us. Which means, right, that we cannot perpetrate social groupings to the exclusion of the corporate body of, life, of Christ as if God designed us to come into the church so that we can be in the men's group or in the women's group or in this group or that group. If those things serve the purposes of discipleship, all the better. But if we forget that we are one body, then we've missed the mark. So the tie that binds us together It's not a social feature, but a spiritual reality, right? The social aspects of the church and its life is an outgrowth of the spiritual bond. In fact, the Scripture is quite clear, right? That we don't build unity. The Spirit has already made unity in the bond of peace. That is the the peace that we share with God and one another because we believe in the gospel. Our job is to maintain the unity that we have by focusing on what is true and right. So we have to invert this idea, right, that the point of church is to bring us and group us with similar people. The point of church is often to put us in a group of people that we would not normally otherwise associate so that we can display the power of God to bring those who are far and near into one body. This is what the early church struggles with. right? You have Jews and Gentiles. Remember the passage I told you about in Acts 10 and 11 with Peter? Peter is indicted by some because he's eaten and associated with the Gentiles. And Peter says, look man... I had a vision, and God dropped this sheet from heaven, and He said, go and eat three times. What does this mean? That everyone...
one is welcome, that there's no one excluded, because we've all been made clean by the blood of Christ. In fact, this is Paul's point in Ephesians chapter 2. To those who are far off, that is the Gentiles, and those who are near, that is the Jews, God has made us one new man, one new body, because we've been reconciled to Him through the cross. Jesus Christ Himself being our peace. So the church, early church fought this battle already. Right? We don't have to fight it again. We are all part of the same group. So the bond that we share is that we all have the same Savior who has brought us into the same family, the very family of God Himself. So that's the first thing, right? We are a people, a church, a diverse group with different gifts and talents to contribute. Second thing is this. A healthy church embraces and employs this diversity for ministry and maturity. So uh, I read you those passages before, but what I want you to do is go to your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter 4. This is a classic passage on life and ministry in the church. What's the purpose of these things? So a healthy church is one who embraces and employs this diversity for ministry and maturity. So let's look in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse uh, 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So the diversity of the gifts in the body, the diversity of the people in the body, is designed to equip everyone, all the saints, that's you and me, for the work of service, right? So what we do when we come together as a body is not just have fun and fellowship, that's good, but we are designed to get together so that we can train one another on how to serve, how to serve God and glorify Him, how to serve others so that we can help others grow, how we can serve the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he goes on. Why? What is the goal of this? To the building up of the body of Christ. So the body of Christ might grow. Grow how? Both in number, right? We want a people to come to know Jesus, but also in depth, in maturity, that we must not, might also grow wide and deep. How do we know we've accomplished this? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Until we're all united and understand what the faith, what the gospel is about and to the knowledge of the Son of God, so that we truly know Him. Not just know about Him, but truly know Him. Because as we do that, we will be made a mature man. That is, we will grow up into Christ, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Well, how do we know that we're doing this? As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So one of the ways that we know if we're growing in maturity with one another is if we're holding fast to the truth and we're not easily tricked by the ways of the world. Isn't that what happens to you as you grow up naturally? Right? When you're young, you tend to be very trusting, maybe a little bit gullible. And then as you grow and you gain wisdom, then all of a sudden you realize, right, not everything that glitters is gold. That's what we say. Right? Or, what's the other one? If it sounds too be, good to be true, right, it probably isn't true, it probably false. Now, the danger is, as we grow, we can also become cynical. So the danger of youth is gull gullibility. The danger of, of wisdom and age is cynicism. Which is why we need both, right? So what do the people who are mature do? They tell people, don't be hoodwinked. And the people who are still youthful and exuberant, they get all of us old fuddy-duddies to... You know, stay engaged. You like that one? You don't say that here? Is that just a Georgia thing? Okay, all right, so I'm in the clear. What do you, what do you guys call the thing at Walmart that you push around? What is that thing? No, okay, that's a buggy, okay? It's a buggy. See, he knows. Look, you just need to go spend some time in Georgia. You'll learn what pecans are, how buggies work, and you'll be good. So what does he say? Right? That you're not tossed here and there, but how also? By speaking the truth in love. 
So we are not carried around by, by foolishness and, and false teaching, but instead we speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into who? Jesus, Him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together. How? By what every joint supplies. That's you and me. You and I, all of us, together, bind the church together as we serve God and one another. You see, this is why ministry across lines, whether those be generational lines or ethnic lines or financial lines or whatever it may be, is so important because all those things are of no consequence to the gospel of Jesus. And if we want to be a people that shows a world that it's always divided, right? I mean, I rejoice when we heard about the, the striking down of Roe v. E. Wade, right? I was so glad that now there are going to be babies who are going to be saved from death. But I was saddened because that wasn't really the war. The war was for the hearts and minds of people who think that their only recourse is to terminate the life of that child. Right? If we want to show a world that's so divided on an issue like that, the power of the gospel, then we as a people have to be united across whatever lines there are, united around the truth of the gospel, not just a, just a, a fuzzy feeling that we want to be happy together, but that we really know what Jesus is about, what He came to do, then the fitting together of every single part will show how that works. You see, the reason the world will never be united is because it doesn't have anything to unite around. But we do. His name is Jesus. You see, He came into the world to die for you and I so that we could be saved from sin, forgiven and reconciled to Him if we will but call upon His name. That's what we need to show the world. That's what we need to exhibit in our own midst. According to the proper working of each individual part. You have a part. I have a part. No part is accidental. And what does this do? Causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Right? This is the paradigm for church ministry. Everyone working together. United around the gospel. That message that never changes so that we can show God's glory, work for each other's good, and proclaim the gospel to a world in need. So, we may not all have the same part to play in every single ministry, right? We may not all be Zach or Buddy and Julie, right? And we work weekly in youth ministry. But we are all, all, call, are all called to prayer we're all called to discipleship. We're all called to service. We're all called to the using of our spiritual gifts for the whole body. So whether it's senior ministry or youth ministry or college ministry or kids ministry, we all have a part to play in the good of all of those things, even if it's not the same part. Perhaps the question is, when's the last time you and I thought and prayed about one of these kids that went out to Children's Church. When's the last time we thought and prayed about one of these students before they went to camp? When's the last time, students, that we thought and prayed about someone on the sheet in your bulletin who's struggling with a physical difficulty? You see, no one gets left out. We all have a part to play in all the ministries of the church because those things are part of the life of of the whole body. To neglect one is to miss out on what God is doing. Now a warning, this is number three. The warning here is this, beware. Because this kind of work in the church can be messy. When we rub together in life, when we actually do the kind of things, what will happen is we'll find out that we're probably not quite as good as we thought we were. And the people that we work with are not quite as nice as we thought they were. And things happen. People say things they're not supposed to say. Our attitudes show we're tired and we don't control our temper, or whatever it may be. 
But in fact, Paul has given us in this passage already what to do. Look over at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I, that's Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing excuse me, tolerance for one another in love. You know how to make church work? This. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance. Churches that are weak, churches that struggle, don't exhibit these characteristics. Remember what I told you guys when I was coming through on the interview process? I emphasized over and over and over again the need for humility. A church without humility will eat itself. But a church with humility will build itself. Because what does humility force me to do? Look out for the interest of another before my own. An amazing thing about humility is if everyone is being humble, no one's needs get left out. Because if I reach 100% your way, and you reach 100% my way, guess what's going to happen? We're going to touch each other. But if I'm standing here going, no, 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 this is what I want. This is what we should do, because I want to do it. And you stand over there saying, well, no, no, this is what we should do, because this is what I want, this is what we should do. Guess what's going to be between us? Space. You see, the church that is humble... Gentle. That is, doesn't stand on its rights, but uses the strength it has for the good of another. Patient, right? That is long-suffering and showing forbearance for one another. Why? Because we love one another. We'll be the church that grows. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, preacher, what happens when things go sideways? Well, look at the end of chapter 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, just in case that didn't cover everything, be put away from you along with all malice. So any kind of ill will you have towards another person, let it go. Let it go. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So what do you do? Forbear. Because people have difficulties and struggles. We all do. If it goes sideways, you forgive. Why? Because of what happens in chapter 5. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You see, Jesus is on a mission to redeem a people, and he knows that we're pretty bad and that we need transformation. We just kind of forget that, that somehow when people come into the church, everything's going to be hunky-dory and we're all like, yeah, we're good. No, this is not the hall of fame of people. Right? As I told you, this is the ICU. This is where people go because they know they need grace. And if we forget that, then we're going to get disillusioned because in church, we're going to have to exhibit grace. So what do we have? Forbearance, forgiveness, and firm faith. The church is worth it. What does he say? In all her glory. You see, when people get hurt in church, whether they're young or old, whatever side of the aisle they're on, we forget that Jesus is working to make us beautiful. Because He is altogether beautiful. And if we are His body and He is the head, then He's going to keep working on us until that day. So what should we do? Let me give you four things here and we'll be done. The first is this. I already mentioned it before, pray. The best way to change our heart when it comes to how we see other people is to pray for them. Okay, I'm not talking about like imprecatory prayer. There used to be this this, uh, country song. I always mention this one because I think about her. 
right? And it's a song about a guy praying for his girlfriend. But he's broken up with her, so he doesn't like her. So what does he pray for? He prays that a, a, a pot falls off of a windowsill and crashes her on the head. And, and he prays that her brakes go out in her car and she ends up dead. And That's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about adults. Pick one or two of these youth or the college students and commit to pray for them every week for a month. And students, pick someone from an adult Sunday school class or an adult ministry or someone on the prayer sheet and commit to pray for them once a week for a month. Because what will happen is that won't just be a name. It'll be a person. A person that Jesus leads us to love. You see, one of the things about prayer is we think somehow prayer is, you know, magic. It's like this magic talisman. We put a, a coin in and then we get a, a, a response out. No, prayer is as much about God changing us through the process of praying as it is His accomplishment. He doesn't need us to pray to work His will. He wants us to pray so that we can see that He answers prayer and that He can change us as we pray. Because prayer is about faith. It's about dependence. It's about acknowledgement that I don't have the power to produce in my life what I want and I am completely at His mercy. Which is a good place to be. Because God is kind and compassionate, full of grace and truth. So let's pray for one another. Let's also participate, right? We've got to, to go beyond, well, that's Zach's job or that's this person's job or whatever, right? We've got to learn to participate with each other. For adults, that may mean picking a youth, a college, or a kid's activity. And even if you don't serve there, you just attend just to see what it's all about, even if your white pants get muddy, right? I mean, it's okay. I, I'm going to be honest with you here. Okay, I was personally disappointed when we did not have normal Wednesday night service a few weeks ago because my hope was that we would have adults, a bunch of adults, come downstairs and go to the Olympians award ceremony. And we didn't. I don't know why. Perhaps we think the church is optional if we don't have something for us. But friend... Those children need to see us supporting them. Do we want them to be the church of tomorrow and today? We've got to treat them like it. And the same holds true in reverse. Right? As students or, or younger adults, right? Maybe we go to the Journey Sisters and their meal. I'm absolutely certain that Miss Sue would be delighted if she had a whole bunch of students come. And you'll get free food. Right? And that's right. right. Get involved in God's storehouse. Take a week and maybe some of you students can go to some of the adult Sunday school classes and see how they do it. You see, part of the problem is it's very difficult to build relationships with other people in the church if we're not willing to interact with them. But that takes participation. On a big level, what about on a personal level? There's a third thing. Pick a person you don't know from a different peer or age group and get to know them. I'm not talking about like, hey, I talked to them once at church. You know, go to lunch or ask them a question about their life. There's a great method called the Ford Method that helps you have a conversation with absolutely anybody. Because there are at least four things that anyone can talk about. The first is family, right? This is, in fact, this is what I do when I meet new people. Hey, how's it going? You, do you have a, a husband or a wife? Or tell me about your kids or grandkids, right? You're guaranteed to hear them talk for at least five minutes. Because people talk about their family, even if they don't like them. Well, I got this crazy family. Well, tell me about it. And guess what happens? As people tell me that stuff, what I do is I, I make mental note of it. So then the next time I say, hey, how's that going with so-and-so and such-and-such? 
family. Second one is occupation or interests. Or if you're young, school, because that's what you're doing. Right? Everybody has a job or something they're interested in. Even if they don't have a job, they work, right? They have something they're interested in. Well, maybe they like aviation, or maybe they like racquetball, or maybe they like whatever. Ask them about recreation. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do for fun? And then dreams. What do you hope will happen? What do you wish for? Now, of course, you don't want to, you're not interviewing them, right? What you're trying to do is to discover who they are as a person. If you do those four things, you can talk to anyone for an hour. I promise. But you've got to pick a person and get to know them. Now here's the last thing. and This is probably the most important. Pioneer the change yourself. I was talking with someone in our church recently because I shared some of these same things on Wednesday night and, and they said to me, you know, I think you're saying the right things, but you know, I, I don't even do that. I know we need to do that. But I don't, I, we don't do that. And I said to them, well, don't wait. This is what happens. They're like, I guess I'll just wait. wait. Until someone comes and does it to me. Well, if those young kids really believed that we were important, they would come and talk to us. That may be true. But if you really believe they were important, you go talk to them too. And that's not just age. That's maybe if you sit over here and you don't know who sits over there. Or if you sit in the back and you don't know who sits in the front. You see, if we want to be a people who display unity in the body, who are committed to every part working together, we can't wait for that part to come to us. We have to be the part that goes to them. You know what's amazing about this? Is that when one person does this, then another person starts doing it. And then another person, and another person, and another person. And before you know it, everybody's doing it. Because we all realize that we're a bunch of cool people hanging out together. we got to pioneer the change ourselves. Don't wait for the other guy. This is what happens in marriage, by the way. In marriages, people start having a little bit of problems, and, and they get upset, and, and then they think, well, if they were really sorry, they'd come and apologize to me. And then the other person says, well, if they're really sorry, they'd come and apologize to me. And before you know it, you drift. But if one person will just go... And say, I'm going to be the one that reaches out. Then what happens is the walls break. The aisles get crossed. And people realize they're just a person like me. Who has struggles and difficulties that God is working on and changing. And that relationship grows and blossoms. I'm so glad that that's already here in our church. But what I want to invite you to is to go deeper and wider. I want you to do it within our body. And I want you to do it out there. That's why we go every third Wednesday to just try to get to know some of the people in our community. Because that way they know we're pretty normal people. We just love Jesus. And they can talk to us. And we can relate to them. But it starts here. With this group. People who are willing to pray. And participate. Pick someone to get to know. And pioneer the change ourselves.